Hi there. This is part of a set of videos that I split off from my main hour-long breakdown of the recent pair of teaser trailers that were released for House of the Dragon Season 2. This one is focused on new dragons and dragon riders. That most of these teasers focused on dragons that we've already seen, the core ones of Cyrax, Caraxes, Vagar. But we got three new shots of note plus some new Dragon Rider characters going to be introduced. We got our first look at Sea Smoke post time skip, our best look at Sunfire yet, and most of all, this big, prominent debut, first time we got to see Bela's Dragon Moondancer, which was supposed to show up in the Season 1 finale, but ultimately got cut for time. If you follow my channel, it turns out the making of House of the Dragon book explained that she was originally intended to be there. A lot of stuff got cut from the season one finale because international markets didn't want it to be a long episode and they have to fit in commercials and it's stupid. But like the one deleted scene that they did screen at conventions was of Bela talking to her grandmother Rhaenys, insisting, I am also a dragon writer, I can do this. That was cut for time and it like would have been followed by something of uh, Bela readying Moondancer or something, just a quick shot. All that got cut, but they, in the making of book, quickly described this is what Moondancer looks like. And if you've heard that, it was actually really hyping us. They said this is one of the hero designs, where it wasn't just, oh, it looks like another dragon. They said we put a lot of thought into making it this unique standout design, get hyped for it. So... I'm trying to break this down because it is in motion in the teaser. We didn't get it, you know, standing still for the profile pic of trying to break down what its design is like. So I'm going to start with the other two dragons quickly just to give you the context of the dragon breeds. What are they doing here? And then based on that, we'll try to break down what they're doing with Moondancer. First, quickly, the dragon at the end of the green teaser is, a is actually Sea Smoke. But I and many other people, when we saw it the first time, thought, well, maybe that's Dreamfire, Helena's dragon. Because why would it be the greens thing when it's a black dragon that, I guess it's just a CGI shot that happened to be done and looked good. But in the Entertainment Weekly accompanying interview that Ryan Connell did, he briefly talked about the dragons. He confirmed, no, that was Sea Smoke in that shot. And he looks a little bigger because this is after the time skip, that the last time we saw... Sea Smoke was in episode 5 at Lenor and Rhaenyra's wedding. And it's been like 16, 17 years since then, so obviously he's grown up, he's bigger, sturdier, and more mature. He's still a younger dragon, you know, he's not as big as Carax, he's not as big as, you know, like Melis or something. But he he's war-capable. Why did we confuse him with Dreamfire? Well, first off, they're similar colors, that he is gray, like Smoke, and Dreamfire is pale blue, and in poor lighting, those look very similar. But this also came up in Season 1, that you briefly saw Dreamfire. She was the dragon under the dragon pit in Episode 6 that scares off Amon with a blast of fire. That you never really got a clear look at her. She was in shadow only briefly. Some of these weren't seen that prominently, like her, like Sunfire, except at that big shot at... Lena's funeral in episode 7, but it was intentionally blurring from a distance so they can refine the design later by season 2. <laughs> but basically we figured out they look very similar because they're both the same breed of dragon. The T-Rex heads, which they set out. So, okay, that was Sea Smoke. Moving along now, let me briefly recap the three dragon breeds that we know of. Back in Season 1, they briefly said there's at least three different breeds, because Martin said make them all look distinct, not just by color, but by shape and design and personality. That was a failure of Game of Thrones, because in the books, Danny's dragons do have different personalities, all three brothers. So they played around with designs and stuff, and they said there's three breeds based on skull shape. T-Rex-shaped heads, horse-shaped skulls, and wolf-shaped heads. But they didn't specify what these breeds are for, what is their function, by way of analogy to horse and dog breeds. I mean, most of those actually have a purpose. You think, oh, why does a poodle look like that? Well, some of them are bred for aesthetics, but a poodle is a water dog. 
that it's meant to swim out and collect ducks that you've hunted or something. It's it's to collect game like that. So that's why its fur is all curly to so it doesn't get wet. It, it retains dryness. So you think of it, oh, this is a mastiff. It's built for for fighting or a Dalmatian built for running. Arabian horse also for speed. So versus like a Clydesdale. That it's not just some fantastical, oh, it's a fantasy thing. High fantasy, things just look cool. Low fantasy, it's meant to serve a purpose. There is a log underlying logic behind it. So please check this out. I will link it at the end of the video. I did a whole breakdown on this, and then I did a sequel video on it. So but look at both of what we know about the three dragon breeds. That after season one, I did a, a post-season analysis. We're going over it, some of the other things they remarked on. I'm just quickly reposting the slides here. Please check out the full video. But I said, I think I can narrow down what the purpose of all three breeds is. That the T-Rex-shaped heads, well, think about it. This is obviously the war breed, like a war horse or a war dog. Big skull meant for bite strength. This thing is meant to fight an enemy head on. Is a good assumption. And I also think they're working backwards of how could Daenerys' three dragons have been so war-capable so quickly, good in a fight. Like, a young Mastiff is a lot better than a young Dalmatian in a head-to-head -head fight, so I think that's the implication they had. There's implications in, in the main novels that Daenerys' dragons are growing unusually fast, because historically some of these things took like 10 to 20 years to grow to the size a human could ride them. Whereas, like, Drogon, at the end of Book 5, is at the point where he can carry Daenerys on his back when he's escaping from Marine. So we're not really sure on that, but okay, they, they, we think they're playing with, well, they're that kind of breed grows really fast and really big. The war dragons, the T-Rex heads, which I think is a fair assumption. The other thing we got during Season 1 is for Cyrax, for the horse-headed ones. Ryan Condal said that Cyrax is built for speed. That they modeled her after a Concorde jet airplane. That she's really sleek, really aerodynamic. Like you think of a really slender horse like an Arabian, built for speed, not for fighting. Okay, so that's the... the there's the speed breed, which I also... I, I lumped in as... I don't think they're actually breeding racing dragons like a racehorse. This thing is purely for speed, so I call it the travel dragon, where it's meant to get somewhere really fast or with endurance, maybe both, more than it is for fighting. So, okay, that's the travel breed versus the war breed. But we, you can pretty much narrow those down. The third one, I admit, is mostly guesswork. What about the wolfhead ones? Well, what do you normally use dogs for? What is their function of something that has a wolf-shaped, dog-shaped head? like a hunting dog. My guess is that they are basically tracker dragons, is the term I came up with. You know, wide set eyes and sensory organs, they're, they're scanning the ground, they're looking for things, and it's not just, oh, they're a scout. I mean, like, a war dog is something that you use in, in war, to, or as a guard dog, to attack something head-on, you know, with people and stuff. A hunting dog, this is something you send out into a badger burrow to dive in there and fight the badger. That this is something that it's supposed to go out solo, tracking down a fox or something, and be able to defend itself. So, while it doesn't have the size of a mastiff or a great dane, it makes up for that with ferocity and intelligence. That when you really hear about hunting dogs that aren't just, you know, a sniffer dog, but the type you let loose and go hunting in a fox hunt, these things are bred for their ferocity and their intelligence. Which explains that, like, Caraxes is really fierce, but, oh, that's the thing. The template we're using for the wolf-headed ones is Jace's dragon, Vermax. He's a wolf-headed one, you can see that. Because Caraxes is officially a mutant. That it's all based on head shape. That Caraxes' snake-like shape has nothing to do with breed. They said he's un officially unusual. They haven't clearly defined it. We think they're referring to some brainstorming meaning they had. But Condal and others have consistently said he's a mutant. He's not like a normal dragon. Why does he look like that? Fan theory I embrace, and others have gone, is um, 
we think Caraxes is an atavistic genetic throwback of sorts to the fireworms. That, according to legend, the Valyrians created the dragons using blood magic by magically crossing wyverns, which are like pterodactyls but can't breathe fire, with fireworms, which are this kind of giant burrowing fire-breathing lizard-type thing, we're not really sure, and combine them to make dragons. And the theory is, because they're more the fireworms are apparently more like a giant fire-breathing snake, burrowing snake of sorts, we think it's that he, in the admixture of their DNA, as it were, I'm making air quotes, that whereas most dragons are like a 50-50 mix, that he's like a 60-40 mix in favor of he's expressing the fireworm DNA a little too strongly compared to other ones. But he's still so fierce and formidable, they don't consider him like a failure or a, f a genetic fluke or something. It's just a little odd. You know, like you can have uh, dog breeds that don't look like their parents, but like one of their grandparents or great-grandparents was in a different breed altogether. And when you have mutts, how complicated it is that sometimes they look like one of their ancestors who you didn't think it would come out like that. Breeding is difficult. And George R. R. Martin is really focused on the, the effects of intentionally breeding something with husbandry like that. Like, the Targaryens themselves are thoroughbreds through intensive inbreeding. That was the point. That he's a giant fan of Jack Vance's The Dragon Masters, and that they have these specific breeds of things. And I talk about this in the main video. But okay, Caraxes is not our template, Vermax is. Why is this so important? Because there's debate over his moon dancer supposed to be Caraxes' daughter or not. That she wouldn't come out looking like Caraxes because he's like a one-time mutation. I, I, I don't know. I, this is one of the things you want to ask. But moving on from that, related to that, is Sunfire, the dragon of Aegon II, who is a formidable fighter. He's younger, but he grows really fast. Again, the, the analogy of that, like, a one-year-old Rottweiler can beat a five-year-old Dalmatian. It's just a really good fighter breed. That he's younger, obviously, he's not vagar sized but he is a scrappy... He, he fights a lot in the war, and he's their mascot. He's officially the mascot of Team Green. Their sigil in the show will be a gold dragon on green. In the books, it was a gold dragon on black, but I think that working in the Hightower green works better for that. We only briefly saw him once at the funeral scene, intentionally in the distance and blurry, and all we saw is he has these really prominent upturned horns, like devil horns almost. And we saw some of the concept art. This is the closest shot we've had yet. Still not a good profile pic, though, but it's narrowing it down. That Looking from the concept art, it's not just that he has two horns coming off the top of his head, it's almost as if he has face plates. Like, the entire side of his face is this plate that keeps going and merges to a point behind his head. It's not just coming out of his temples. Like some of the other dragons, their big horns are just one part of their head. It's coming out of their brow or something. This is as if it's just an extension of his whole face. Like an attached earlobe versus a detached one almost, but more so. Not quite sure what the specific final version will look like, but we've seen this, we've seen concept art, it's narrowing down what it'll look like. But more than his body shape, that I can't tell from this what breed he's supposed to be, other than he's not the travel breed. We didn't think he would be. Is he the war dragon? Is he more of a wolf-headed one? Is somewhere in between? The bigger thing is the quote that Ryan Condal gave about his coloration and design, which is, it's not just it's nothing to do with his shape. It's the book consistently says he is the most beautiful dragon that ever lived, in Westeros. And it's not that he is golden-colored, as in kind of orangey. No, Cyrax is yellow. Sunfire is the color of shining metal gold. That it looks almost like he's made of metal. But still a live animal. He doesn't look fantasy. And it's really intriguing. This is the point of the whole video, leading up to the Moondancer stuff, at least, of Ryan Condal talking about the extreme design challenge of making Sunfire and balancing those two extremes. Quote, Sunfire was described so specifically in the book as the most beautiful dragon who ever lived, I think it was incumbent upon us to try to rise and meet that challenge. 
but doing so in a way that didn't seem like we were making a dragon from a different show. Like, he's supposed to be really beautiful, but not a, quote, fantasy dragon, for lack of a better word, Condal says. So Sunfire had to exist as a cut above that would be recognized as distinctly beautiful within a world that has 17 other dragons running around. Those distinctions came down to the texturing, but also the dragon's movement, how it was animated, and what its dragon call sounds like. More on that to be revealed, but designing Sunfire was fun and challenging. But I get the feeling we're going to have like a full 10 minute behind the scenes segment in the making of videos. Like there'll be like a full chapter on the work that went into making Sunfire. That some of these other ones might just be like, I think Tyraxes is probably a smaller version of Vermax. Versus a lot of time and energy went into planning this. That it has to be instantly recognizable as beautiful compared to all the other ones. I, I would assume his movement means he's really graceful and fluid. But still somehow that right balance of it's realistic. This isn't Azeroth, this isn't World of Warcraft, where it is indeed made of living metal. No, it's an animal that happens to have like metallic gold scales almost, like sometimes you see a snake or something and go, it almost, almost looks like there's metal in the scales just the way the light hits it, but not. So it has to hit you that, wow, this thing is different from the other ones. It's so much more fluid in its design, and it, it's shining. And we tried to brighten the shot up here from the teaser, but at the same time, it's not fantasy. And what's his personality? We don't know that the whole thing of um, the dragon bond really is a low-level subconscious psychic bond. That, you know, they go, oh, your pets start to act like you or you like your pet. Literally, in this case, the dragons have the personality of their rider, the Caraxes matches Daemon, that Cyrax and Melis are regal the way that Rhaenys and Rhaenyra are. What would Sunfire be like? I'm not really sure, and vagar has got her own thing because she's had more than one rider. She kind of feels like a loner because she's the only dragon that's that old, and I guess it's, that's also how Aemon was kind of a loner. How would they do this, and what would his dragon call sound like to set him above the other ones that it's not just a, that it's supposed to be memorable that he's got such a great call is it supposed to be beautiful i would assume so, as opposed to something menacing it must be nice to listen to compared to how caraxes to show how he's a little off that his design is like he's still strong he's not like a cripple but he's just something feels like a mishmash of genetic throwback in there that they said he sounds like he has a deviated septum caraxes that he has this sort of high-pitched whine whistle almost to his call which i think is actually kind of more menacing because it's it's off template there that compared to caraxes what would sunfire sound like in the sound design so looking ahead there's going to be a lot of stuff in the design for sunfire more than can be conveyed in still shots even if we got a clear one, because they said a lot of this is like, apparently has really fluid movements, a really personality that went into that. Because you know, like Caraxes has personality that goes into his movements that isn't conveyed by just a still shot either. But moving along from that, the thing I was really looking forward to was the parts about Moondancer. Having talked about all those other ones, and the reason I went through them first is... I mistook this to be Sunfire in the first breakdown I did, the first instant reaction video I did for the teaser the day it came out. I thought, is this Sunfire from a bad angle? Because the House of the Dragon making of book that came out 12 months ago, when it leaked a physical description for Moondancer, it described her as having this really prominent mohawk-like fin in the middle of her head. And there's been a lot of fan art of this. It's like twice the length of her head, this huge fin, they described it. And well, you're probably exaggerating that in our fan art. But I think that my mistake was due to this is in motion, she's diving, so it's a weird angle we're seeing it from. And because she's diving, you think when a, when a dragon is diving towards something, like a cat lowering its hackles, 
it, it would lower its fins. It's not making a threat display. It's sleeking itself to try to go faster. So I think Moondancer in this specific shot just slicked her fin back. That she's not holding it erect. That it's not having a fin erection on her head there. And it's blurry, and at first I thought it was her other horn because she's holding her head at like a 45 degree angle, but... Okay, that I realized, okay, that is, this isn't a good look at Moondancer. The real hero shot that we'll use in, like, profile pics is when we see a shot of her, like, in her stable doing a threat display and having her fins all extended. That this is slicked back, she's in motion. What the heck is her skull shape? She's not one of the horse-headed ones. I think she's one of the wolf-headed ones, the, the, the wider head with the eyes are under a ridge, because they're supposed to look down, not up. I'm not really sure. And the other problem is some of these younger dragons might be mutts. They might be combinations of breeds. That was the thing that came up in my last video on this, that um, I did manage to contact Constantin uh, Sakaris, one of the two concept artists on this over Instagram, just quickly. Language barrier, he's German. But I asked quickly, and he, he did say, you know, while we did keep these breeds in mind, they're more of a guideline than a rule. Because ultimately what led to each dragon's design was more about them as individuals. That, like, you know, most dogs that you see out in the world aren't thoroughbreds. That a dog might be mostly golden retriever, but it's not like it came off of an assembly line. There's going to be variations. Unless you have, like, a certified pure breed... That you can see, well, this thing, when you have an unspecified breed, it's, well, oh, that looks sort of like a Rottweiler, but can you confirm that with a certificate? So, I mean, considering that they started out with, what, three to five dragons when they fled Valyria, and they're really inbred, and some of them are mixed and matched from other breeds that came about. It's not like they have pure breeding lines that they're keeping distinct with the Targaryens. They can't go, oh no, we can't breed those two dragons together. It'll make a cross. They are on the brink of extinction. Let them cross, so they're not thoroughbreds anymore. So I'm not really sure what they're doing with Moondancer. But looking at this, this is clearly Moondancer. Um, first off, someone pointed out, you can see the red cape of Bela on the back. The Aegon wouldn't have a red cape like that. So this is Bela on Moondancer. Another thing is, apart from the Mohawk, the Making of book described that she has this really intricate pattern design to her scales. We're not sure what that means, but in this wide shot here of her flying around, you can see it, I'm zooming in, it's blurry, but this sort of ripple pattern in her wings. This is a wide shot, it's not really good, but yeah, I, this is what they were talking about. We, have, we don't have a good shot of it yet that there's a sort of rippled, banded patterning to her scales that they said was very intricate and very beautiful. Not really sure. So, this is what we have for Boon Dancer. I cannot determine what breed she's supposed to be, if she even is meant to be a specific breed. Because they did kind of describe her as a little off-template, but not so much as Caraxes. I mean, from this brief shot, like... From one or two shots of Caraxes, could you tell that he has, like, these mini wings on his back legs that other dragons don't have? Because they weren't extended in those shots. Does Moondancer, like, looking at her tail in these shots, does her tail, like, have this sail-like feature on it that's held down that other dragons don't have? It's not extended in these shots, but it's blurry, it's in motion. I look forward to their official explanation of all of this, of the thought that went into her design, but they said... This wasn't just, oh, here's another dragon. More than some other ones thought went into what does Moondancer look like, design-wise. Well, an issue is Moondancer is a bit younger in the books, and this is a change they're making. I'm not going to go over this too much because I talked about it elsewhere in the uh, teaser breakdown back in December. When we saw, when we saw shots of Bela riding, we just didn't see the dragon yet, and I talked about this as sort of a change that... It appears she's going to arrive at Rook's Rest. And I said in the big battle of Rook's Rest in episode 4 that it's sort of an ambush, and I wouldn't be in favor of that because then you'd have to explain how she didn't die. Because she's a younger dragon in the book. She's younger than Luke's dragon, Arax. That there is no way Moondancer could survive fighting other dragons yet, but she grows up season to season. They even say, like, 
Bela is a dragon rider and that she's ridden it around the island a little. But I, I went and checked. It says right at the beginning of the war, after the war was declared, it said, oh, and a month later, Bela flew Moondancer for the first time between Dragonstone and Driftmark. That up until then, she had to like be carried on ship and stuff. She couldn't even cross to the mainland physically, but she was growing month by month. Dragons can grow very fast. So they've changed that up a bit, but then again, the kids are older in the TV show for legal reasons. That, well, Bela is a bit older in the TV show. Why not just have her dragon be a little older? Fair enough. But still, like, Vermax, even Vermax, okay, maybe... I, I get the sense from looking at this, just putting them side by side, is this roughly the size of Jace's dragon, maybe smaller? Maybe not Arax's size, but the, the biggest point is this thing, you would not risk going up against Vagar or even Sunfire with these, that Vermax would lose if he fought Sunfire, that, and Moondancer definitely, at this point in time, they grow up, of course, that there is no way that they'd have to grow up to the point you'd be able, willing to take them to war. What we think or hope is that Bela will show up near the end of the battle and is looking for survivors or something. This is a big point from the teaser. Notice that, it, it, tell me if I'm crazy here, it looks like Bela is racing somewhere, okay? It also looks like Kristen Cole is racing somewhere on horseback. That they weren't charging through the forest to get to Rook's Rest is a castle, why would you do a cavalry charge at it? That doesn't make sense. And it's not the whole army, and it doesn't match what we saw in spy photos. I think that, keeping this as vague as possible, when the older dragons are fighting in midair in the Battle of Rook's Rest, they get into a tackle, they, they tackle each other in midair, they're fighting, they're not flying anymore, so they drag each other to the ground and keep fighting. There's a point where the... the ball of drag adult dragons who were fighting each other crashes to the ground and at the crash site there, there's activity and i think that because the crash site is away from the main battlefield everyone's racing there to try to save them in the logical deduction okay Kristen's racing where did the dragons fall and moon dancers going there too and mild spoiler that vagar is part of that dragon pile and you you saw her in the trailer and it says she wasn't significantly hurt, because she's she's big, she can take a hit. That maybe Moondancer will race there, but then they realize, she realizes, oh god, Vagar is relatively unhurt, I can't face Vagar, and has to reluctantly flee. I'd be fine with that. I don't want them to do something really weird that, like, is implausible. Because this is a change, I just want changes to make sense. Why am I judging? I can't judge it until I see it, that... This could turn out to be a really good change, so long as it's... You can't have her implausibly escape the way D Danny in Season 7 was zipping all around to the wall and stuff. Not even the zipping around, but why is the Night King targeting the other dragon? Why is he attacking her? She's the only one with a rider. Stuff like that. Of just If they add it and it makes sense, I might end up really enjoying it. Because we wanted them to give Bela and Moondancer more to do. So that's as much as we can discern from that right now. The other thing, which I'm only going to quickly cover here, because it was mostly covered by everyone else, that now the days have passed, this one shot of Rhaenyra with the new dragon riders that they find. That, remember, at the end of Season 1, they said, we have six riderless dragons on Dragonstone. Where are we going to get riders for them? Because you need Valyrian blood. The Valyrians have the dragon rider gene in them. And they go, well, we've run out of legitimate Targaryens. What about illegitimate Targaryens? That they've been living on Dragonstone and Driftmark for a couple hundred years. Over time, Targaryen princes have had bastard children. And grandchildren of bastards. That if you think you have like a drop of Targaryen or Valarian blood in you, because it's all mixed up, try your luck at claiming one of the unclaimed dragons. And they're called the Dragon Seeds, these bastards, because they're born of Dragon Seed. And many try, few survive, and four succeed. 
We think the fourth one, Nettles, will only be introduced in the Season 3 premiere. I've gone over this in other videos. I'll link it at the end. What we think they're doing, because spy photos did seem to show two, not one, but two black women lined up amongst the Dragon Rider candidates. I think they're going to do it the way they did with uh, Stannis' wife in Season 2, where they only actually cast the role in Season 3, so they had a stand-in technically playing it in Season 2 that for wide shots there will be black women in the lineup of candidates to establish they're someone trying out, but that they'll only claim their dragon by the season 3 premiere. That this is actually going at a very slow pace, and I'm fine with that. So, fine, that, that's fair enough. But clearly, at this table, with the dragon seeds, there are only three instead of four. And we know what some of them look like from spy photos. At right seems to be Kieran Bu as Hugh Hammer. The one facing away from us is his friend Ulf the White. And at left is, I can't believe this keeps coming up, this is Adam of Hull, played by Clinton Liberty. The same issue came up in the December teaser, and I made a separate video going, for God's sake, this isn't Nettles. Because even though, because you saw him at an angle, people are going, this must be Nettles, this must be Nettles. This is a man. This clearly looks like Clinton Liberty. And we have had prominent spy photos, gorgeous spy photos, of Clinton Liberty that this is his costume and hairstyle. The issue is that in the books he has silver hair, like a Valyrian. And why does he have black hair here? That is a good question. One theory I have is maybe he dyes his hair to hide his heritage. That there's multiple characters in the books and prequels like Duncan Egg. There's Targaryen bastards who dye their hair so people don't realize they have Valyrian blood. That could be what's at play here. I'm not really sure. But, I again, I have a separate distinctive video on this is him, not Nettles. And that what we think, I'm going to link that at the end, right next to the Dragon Breeds video. That this is him, he has a younger brother, Alan of Hull, who just tried but failed to claim a dragon but survived. He's also a big character, played by Abu Bakar Salim from uh, Raised by Wolves. So he, he's the brother of a dragon rider, and the, he's also going to be a major recurring character. We haven't seen him in costume yet, but he'll come up later. So this shot really confirmed to me that Nettles is not in Season 2, because we also know from spy photos the sowing of the dragon seeds is in the second-to-last episode. And that might just be when it starts, not when it ends. That they do say, Nettles, the fourth one, it took her a while to claim her dragon because she managed to claim one of the wild ones, the Mustangs, that everyone thought was untamable, and she had to slowly build up its trust in her by getting it, by feeding it, leaving uh, sheep out for it to get used to her presence. Took a long time, so I, I simply think she's showing up in the season three premiere. And if you keep your eyes peeled in season two, there's going to be points where they're setting it up. That you have a black girl in the background in the line of candidates. This, of course, ties into people asking where the heck is Daron Targaryen, Allison's fourth child. They have said more about that, promising he will show up. And I think it's he will also show up in the Season 3 premiere, but they will start mentioning him in Season 2. So that's a separate video I'm splitting off from this that also has cited quotes about what's going on with Daeron. But as for the new dragons and dragon riders, they also said... Condal said there are five new dragons in Season 2. I can't get in his head to determine what his counting scheme is. That's the problem, because does he consider Sunfire a new dragon, or Dreamfire, or Vermithor? When those three dragons briefly appeared, fuzzy and in the background, blurry in the background in Season 1, does he consider that new? Or did he get mixed up that Moondancer was originally going to be in Season 1, but then got cut at the last minute? Does he consider Moondancer new? That one I think he would. But... What we do know is from other leaks, people have said Moondancer is in Season 2, so is Joff's dragon Tyraxes, because he's going to the Vale with it, and that we would see young Aegon's Stormcloud hatching. Remember that Daemon said, I'm collecting eggs? He's going to, like, hatch Stormcloud and give it to his son. But does Ryan Condal count Stormcloud as one of the five new dragons? Or when he says five, is he not counting hatchlings? I don't know, because Vermithor isn't new. 
uh, in some considerations. Sea Smoke definitely isn't new. I mean, he's got a new design because he's older. Silverwing will definitely be new. She is the one that's claimed by Ulf, and she'll have an interesting design. The other thing I'm really looking forward to with the new dragons is they said that just because they, they psychically copy the people they're with, but on a subtle level, that just as Jaehaerys was married to his queen Alisan for, you know, like 50 years, his dragon Vermithor became the mate of her dragon Silverwing. And even after their first riders died, they remained a mated pair. That what is the we've only ever seen one or two dragons in, in Daenerys's time. Is there a social hierarchy? Are they social? Well, not really, but they are capable of forming pair bonds, at least in some circumstances. That what would you would you see them nuzzling or something to show well they're a pair? That they're not just solitary. How, how do you show them interacting? That'd be interesting. I mean, when they're not fighting, of course. I mean. That would really excite me, seeing, like, the one or two times we saw, like, how is Caraxes reacting to Cyrax in, in episode two? Just seeing friendly ones together is interesting. So, what are the five? I'll discuss this in the comments. I'll try to respond to every comment of, it's a fool's errand of trying to get in Condal's head of, what do you count as new? Not really sure, and I'm hoping for more CGI in the full trailer due in May.